Double day to current day. This is a Vintage Baseball uh, Daily Rewind. Today's show is about December 15th, and as of 2022, there have been 94 Major League Baseball players who have been born, 42 Major League Baseball players who passed away, and over 70 other events ranging from awards, signings, fights, and more. And there are five, these are five things about uh, December 15th that we want to tell you about. And just as a side note, you know, I've done this a few times now, and it seems like there's always around 100 births, and there's always around 40 to 45 deaths. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. <laughs> Symmetry. It's baseball for you. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Fenway Park. This is Mark Fidrich. Now, each time he gets the ball back, you'll see him mumble a couple of words to the ball. The first man ever to pitch five career no-hitters. Catch him all, Joe! I don't believe what I just saw! Chance for Mitchell, and he makes a pair handed catch. Ricky goes, a pitch stick, and he's going to have it. Leaps high of the air, and he's got it. What an incredible kill by the kid. And let it be said that number eight, Cal Ripken Jr., has reached the unreachable star. Today, Today I, consider I consider myself the luckiest, the luckiest man, man on the face, on the of, the face earth. of the earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we invite you to rise. Yeah, right, right. So, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm, you know, I'm still, we're recording this after the winter meetings have finally finished in San Diego, so I'm still, even though it's been like a week, licking my wounds about Jacob deGrom leaving, leaving my Mets, but I'll take the consolation prize of, of Justin Verlander for sure, but it still stings a little bit and feels just so weird because he had his press conference today, the day that we're recording. It's just really weird to see him in a different jersey and hat for sure. I think that's the most difficult thing is when we watch these players that we've invested so much of our time and emotion into leave. Um, and you never want to see them leave. And then, and then they leave. And, and, you know, and you do get Verlander, which I think, I think is a fantastic move for the Mets. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the guy still is pitching great. Um, and I, he, I, he's going to give you 30 starts and probably a, 180 plus innings and an ERA and a below three. So, um, I'll take it. I'll take it. I mean, a lot of people are saying that like it's just moving parts with the Mets rotation and stuff like that, but not quite. If Verlander stays healthy, healthy all year, which he has mostly done throughout most of his career, that's immediately an upgrade just because the Mets didn't have DeGrom until August this past year. So uh, it would be nice to see him and Scherzer going at it every you know every two two out of every five days that would be a lot of fun i i think other than the tommy john surgery i'm not sure if berlin has ever been hurt i don't think so i'd have to check his his um his stat page but i think you're right i mean he's pretty much he's got a really special arm it's it's amazing that it took as long as it did for him to finally get tommy john surgery and he wants to pitch till he's like in his mid forties. I mean, I think he's he's got like a new arm now, pretty much. So I mean, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, um, I yeah, he's he, and he I I would he's pitching better since he went to Houston than he was in Detroit his last few years. Yeah, this is like it feels like his second peak, and it feels like longer than what his peak in Detroit was. I don't know that for a fact, but I mean, he's had at least six six WAR from, I think, 2018, 2019, and this past year. During the regular season, he's your guy. Uh, there's, mm. no, there's no question about it. Uh, his, playoff, uh, his playoff appearances have been a little shaky, but um, in, in the regular season, the guy's money. Um, and you're going to need him because the Phillies have loaded up pretty heavily um, in this offseason, for sure. Yeah, and the Braves have their young core uh, locked up till the next millennium at this rate. So, uh, yeah, I know this is going to be – very interesting uh, three-headed fight, you would imagine. We'll see. I mean, I don't think the Nationals, maybe in the Marlins. The Marlins have a lot of good young pitching, so we'll see what they do if they get some offense. But, um, but yeah, at least those top three. That'll be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, the Marlins are probably due for their, um, you know, one <laughs> run. <laughs> their, their sporadic World Series title? Yes. Before they, before they sell everyone off, I don't know about the Nationals. I don't think, I don't think they're going to be good for a while. Um, but but you do have a, a three-headed race there. But with the expanded playoffs, uh, at least two of the teams will, will get in, maybe three. Um, you know, and you got to figure San Diego and LA, they're going to beat each other up pretty good this year. So mm, that will also be interesting to watch. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
So um, let's get into it here. Let's do a little trivia. Um, this is an interesting one that I came across. Uh, in Major League history to date, there have been uh, 235,500 games have been played uh, in, in, in the history of the game. But only five times in the history has a player led off a game with a home run and then hit a walk-off home run. Can you name the five? You know, thanks to me diving into home run history, like I do at MLB Daily Dingers, I knew of two off the top of my head, but I, did, I, don't, I didn't know the other ones until I, I looked down at, towards the end. So it'll be uh, interesting to, to talk through the rest of them for sure. Um, but our first fact, uh, we'll start, it was on the morning of December 16th, 1896, if you picked up the Baltimore Sun newspaper and turned to page 16, you saw an article titled, The Pitching Cannon at Work. Uh, in 1896, Princeton University mathematics instructor Charles Hinton designed a gunpowder-powered baseball pitching machine for the Princeton University baseball team's batting practice. According to one source, it caused several injuries and may have been partly responsible for Hinton's dismissal from Princeton that year. A demonstration was given in the school's gymnasium on December 15th, 1896. And Hinton died unexpectedly in 1907 from a cerebral hem hemorrhage. And while he was mostly remembered for his work on the fourth dimension, in stark contrast, he was also credited with designing the first playground jungle gym. That's that's a, quite an eclectic uh, legacy to leave. And as a, a someone with a couple of young kids, I'm very thankful for jungle gyms for sure. So, <laughs> are, you, are you more thankful for jung jungle gyms or pitching machines? Mm, that's a really good question. I would have to probably side with pitching machines because, I mean, you know, when I was in high school, we were able to set up our pitching machine in like the last segment of the gym that was like, kind of like blocked off. So like instead of, you know, studying at, in study hall during baseball season, we would just go and just hit in the machine for 40 minutes until the bell rang. So I'd probably say I'm probably more thankful for the pitching machine. All right. So we're going to jump ahead to December 5th, 1967. And I know this is something that's going to play on your heart because this is about the Mets. Uh, when the Mets uh, obtained Tommy Aggie from uh, the 1966 Rookie of the Year um, in the utility infield at Al Weiss from the White Sox in exchange for Buddy Booker, Tommy Davis, Jack Fisher, and Bill Wynn. Uh, New York's uh, newest additions will both play pivotal roles in the team's 1969 World Series championship. Now, Aggie, he's going to struggle with this first year in New York. He batted just 217 with 17 RBIs, and he had a horrendous 0 for 34 stretch in April. But then in 1969, he really bounced back. He hit 271 with 26 home runs for the Miracle Mets, and he was just he was a real force for that team. And of course, in the World Series against the Orioles, he made he was a star of Game Three, hitting a home run off of, uh, Jim Palmer, making two spectacular catches that saved a total of five runs. And he won the 1969 Comeback Player of the Year award. And he's going to eventually be elected into the Mets Hall of Fame after his death in 2001. Yeah, I mean, when you think of certain people who are just crucial parts of a championship roster, I mean, obviously, AG is one of them for sure. And I mean, and for me, growing up and becoming becoming a Mets fan and really starting to pay attention to the Mets, I would say maybe like mid to late '90s or so. You know, watch games on TV, go to Shea Stadium, and just see this big thing up in like the upper tank of left field where he hit home run. I think it was in '69. It was either a '69 or '70. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but one of the longest home runs you know ever hit at at Shea Stadium, and I'm always thinking like, man, who was that guy when I was you know a young kid, 10, 11, 12, and before I could figure out I could actually look him up on the internet uh, and see exactly who he was. And it's um, yeah, it's you know something that one of those things that I do miss about Shea. I mean, Shea was certainly a dump, but. Uh, it had that kind of charm uh, that made everyone think, well, it's, it's our dump. It's fine. It's, it's still a place that, you know, we all just enjoy being at. And having those little things, you know, like, you know, the spot where we hit that home run, uh, I do miss those, those little details of Shea for sure. I think that's lost in the old ballparks. And it, you know, I've been, I've been to a lot of ballparks. So, you know, I've been to like PNC and Petco and uh, back when, you know, they, they've changed the name to the Giants Stadium too many times. Uh, I think it's Oracle now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was packed all the first time I went. Um, but you, when you go to those parks, they're fantastic for amenities, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I've been to um, City Field, uh, and, I've been to, and I went to Shea the year before they uh, tore it down. And those old ballparks, 
they have they have uh, memory to them, and and then they may not be the best places to watch a game and sit and everything. But when you sit when you're there, you just feel you feel the memories, uh -huh. and, and you don't feel those memories in the new park. But you enjoy the men the you know the amenities, but you don't feel those memories. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I, I remember going to old Yankee Stadium in 08, the, the last year before it closed, and then going to a game at the new Yankee Stadium in 09, while they still had the old stadium up, they still hadn't taken it down yet. And like, like walking through, I think there was a spot in the new stadium where I could see th like outside and still see like some of the lights on in the old stadium it just looked so wrong. It really just looks so wrong, and like obviously, like you create new memories in a new place and stuff like that. But it's not so, that's you know when you think about like that Yankee mystique and the ghosts and all you know all like the all the things that happen in the postseason, like you can't recreate that stuff in a new place. And it's I, I remember looking at it and thinking, God, this is so sad. Like why didn't they just take it down before the season started? Before people started coming and seeing this, like it just it didn't feel right. Going to Yankee Stadium, of course. But when I went there to see the 2003 ALCS, and you're looking out in center field, and that's where Mickey Mantle played, mm. and Joe DiMaggio, and Combs, and that's where Babe Ruth played, and Lou Gehrig. It's a different feeling, and you can almost feel them there, and you don't get that in the new park. Um, mm. And I think that it must have been really airy to be looking at the old park when you're sitting in the new park. Yeah. Very, very much so. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so we'll shift a little bit further ahead to December 15th, 1974. Oakland A's pitching star and Cy Young Award winner Catfish Hunter is declared a free agent. Arbitrator Peter Seitz ruled that A's owner Charlie Finley committed a breach of contract by failing to make a payment to Hunter's life insurance fund. The four-time 20-game winner who helped Oakland to World, World Series championships in 1972, 73, and 74 will sign a five-year deal worth a record $3.75 million with the New York Yankees, speaking of the devil. The decision will usher in a new era in the owner's relationship with their players. Yeah, I think free agency changed baseball just a little bit. Yeah, I think so. As we're on the heels of the winter meetings, when I think it was like $1.5 billion have been spent on, on player talent. Yeah, it's, I think so. The thing about free agency, the owners said they didn't have the money, they didn't have the money. And then all of a sudden, players became free agents, and they had the money. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they, you know, Reggie Jackson signs a huge deal, and Messi Smith, and uh, you know, it was player after player, and they did that crazy draft in the beginning, where they were so different now. But um, you know, when you just look, when you think about how that changed the dynamics of the game, and it actually, you know, a lot, a lot of fans, especially because you know, I do a lot of the old stuff. They they, they talk about this in the good old days and everything. But the reality is baseball has never had more parity than it does now because of free agency. Mm -hmm. um, because the Padres can go and sign, you know, Xander Bogarts. I never would have assumed the Padres would be a player in free agency, but they are. Um, and I think that's great for the overall sport. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you, know, you think of a team like the Padres, not a major market, you see them being able to carry a $200 plus million dollar payroll, and it's like, okay, what's everyone else's excuse? I think that's a really good point. Uh, if if a team is not doing that, they're just doing it to you know to maximize their personal their, their income for their business. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Pirates are historic for that, which is a shame because that's a, a wonderful baseball city. Have you ever been to PNC? I have, I have. Actually, the one time we went there was I think it was ended up being a Starling Marte walk off, which was a lot of fun. But yeah, beautiful park. Beautiful city. Just being able to like walk around the stadium and just you know, kind of just taking in the city itself. Yeah, totally agree with you. It's a great place, and it's really a shame that that franchise hasn't been able to have consistent success because of who's sitting in the ownership box. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you walk over the Clemente Bridge, and they have that great museum in the center of town. Mm -hmm. um, it, and if you sit, if you're sitting there, and you, it, because of the team and everything, you don't get a lot of. Um, casual fans, you're usually sitting next to somebody that knows a lot about baseball and they're fun to talk to. Yeah. So, all right, so we're going to go to December 15th in 2010, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Hall of Famer Bob Fellow passed away. Um, Fellow was blessed with a resilient arm and an overpowering fastball that frequently approached 100 plus miles an hour. Uh, he was one of the most dominating pitchers of his era. Um, despite missing four full seasons during the peak of his career to join the World War II effort, um, 
Fella compiled 266 victories over the course of 18 big league seasons. Uh, he had three no-hitters and a record 12 one-hitters. Uh, many people still feel that no one has ever thrown the ball harder than Bob Fella. And he was born on November 3rd in 1918. Uh, and I just found this fact kind of interesting about, about him. He was born in a small midwestern town in Van Meter, Iowa. Uh, he actually credited milking cows and picking corn and baling hay to strengthen his arm and giving him the capacity to throw as hard as he did. And uh, he never pitched a day in the minors. Uh, he pitched for um, Van Meter High School. Uh, he signed uh, with the Indians for a dollar and an autographed baseball, uh, which <laughs> is very, I, I find that a super interesting fact. Um, and he made his major league debut uh, with his team on July 19th, 1936. And uh, he was three months shy of his 18th birthday at the time. Uh, he n never spent a day in the minors. Um, and he struck out set 15 St. Louis Browns in his first um, major league start. Uh, he finished that season five and three with a 3.34 ERA, 76 strikeouts, and only 62 innings. Uh, you could go on and on about Fella. Um, he was not only a great pitcher, but he was a great person, um, a World War II veteran, and um, you know, just an amazing guy. Mm. Who who autographed that baseball? Do you know? I don't. I I researched it uh, and I could not find that. Uh, could not find that. I did that as a trivia on one of my uh, podcasts previously. Um, what what Hall of Fame signed for a dollar in autographed baseball? It's like that. Yeah, that's what he signed for. Talk about return on investment. <laughs> I think that worked out for the, uh, <laughs> the Indians, right? Yeah, I think that worked out okay. Um, all right, so uh, before we get to the trivia, I'm just going to give you quick words about TomsVintageBaseball.com. I'd like to say that baseball is the only game you can watch on the radio. Tom's Vintage Baseball is all about voices of the game, announcers, game highlights, interviews. You know, here we just highlighted Bob Feller, Catfish Hunter, and the 69 Mets. You know, uh, in, with Feller, uh, the, the whole 1948 um, World Series that you could listen to, there's a dozen of his, he had, he had a radio show. Uh, on his radio show, we talked about coming back from the war and his first start. And here's just a little clip of that show. Bob Feller Show, program number 23. It's difficult to pinpoint the toughest situation for a pitcher. Naturally, a bases-loaded, no-out situation in the bottom of the ninth would be a nightmare for any pitcher. But how about a pitcher who must join his club late in the season after, say, four years in the service? No spring training, no exhibitions, no major league tune-ups of any kind. Well, I know how it feels, because I was in that kind of a situation on August 14th, 1945. I was back in my club, the Cleveland Indian, and my manager, Lou Boudreau, nominated me to face the league-leading Detroit Tigers. I took my warm-up pitches, and I knew I'd find out soon enough if I had it. The first Detroit batter, Jimmy Outlaw, was a strikeout victim. I felt good. The second batter was out on a fly to center field. Then Doc Kramer caught hold of one of my fastballs and sent it to the deep right center for a triple. Hank Greenberg was the next batter. I knew I had my work cut out for me. I worked especially hard on Hank. I slipped a strike past him, then made him swing and miss one. Another pitch, and Greenberg was caught looking. The inning was over, and Kramer was stranded on third. I had my first test, but there were eight more innings to go. My teammates touched opposing pitcher Hal Newhauser for two runs in our half of the first inning. My control was a bit shaky as I faced the Tigers in the second inning, and I walked the first two batters. Long ball hitting Rudy York was the next batter. I threw hard, and Rudy swung and missed. Then another strike, and finally a third. I had two more outs to go before I could get out of the inning safely. The next batter was a pop-up, and so was the other. Paul Richards, now general manager of the Houston Colts, was the first Tiger batter in the third, and he doubled. I walked the next batter. There was some activity in the Indian bullpen, and I knew it. I had to get out of this trouble myself, but a single scored one run, and another hit sent the tying run across. Somehow, I finished the inning without any more scoring. It was now 2-2, a brand new ball game. My teammates got me a run in the third inning, and I was determined now to go all the way and win this one. I set the Tigers down without a hit in the fourth, then the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. I was really rolling along but I still had the ninth inning to go. In 60 seconds, I'll be back for the final inning of a game I will always remember. My teammates had picked up another run for me, and the Indians led 4-2 to two as I went to the mound for the ninth inning. I retired the first batter. Now I had two to go. The second man was a strikeout victim. 
My fastball was sizzling, and my arm appeared to be getting stronger as the innings rolled along. Lead-off man Jimmy Outlaw was next. I reared back and fired. He swung and missed. The next pitch tipped the outside corner for a called strike. Only one more to go. I was ready, but so was Outlaw. The pitch, strike three. My return from the war was a big success. I knew then I still had a lot of good pitching left in my right arm, and the almost four-year hit to the Navy did not hurt me. You know, Catfish Hunter, World Series games in 72 and 73. Um, and, of course, in 69 with the Mets, uh, there's a dozen of the regular season games. Seaver's near uh, perfect, perfect game and the whole 69 World Series that you could listen to. There's over 300 games uh, from 1930s to 1970s, hundreds of interviews, game highlights. You try it out for free, see if you like it. And, you know, there's a mobile app, so you can take it on the go with you. If you're going for a walk or a run, a long car ride or something like that, just take it in the app, hit play, and you can, uh, you know, just fill your ears with these amazing games. Um, so, TomSwitchesBaseball.com, love to see you over there. And Matt, how about that trivia? All right, so we're going to be talking about the five players who've hit a leadoff and a walkoff home run in the same game. And when we hear the name Billy Hamilton today, many of us think about the speedster who's really just bounced around the big leagues for the majority of his big league career. Uh, he stole 155 bases as a minor leaguer in 2012, and between the minors and the majors, he swiped more than 700 bases throughout his professional career. But there was a better version of Billy Hamilton folks don't talk about very much. In 1892, Billy Hamilton became the first player to hit both a leadoff and walkoff home run in the same game. Only Vic Power in 1957, Darren Erstad in 2000, Reed Johnson in 2003, and Ian Kinsler in 2009 have accomplished the same feat. Uh, and speaking of Billy Hamilton, we'll, we will go fast forward a little bit more to December 15, 1940, when the Hall of Fame outfielder died at the age of 74. Hamilton stole 912 bases and batted 344 over his 14-year career, placing him in the top 10 on the all-time batting list. Hamilton revolutionized the game of baseball by making the head-first slide, the first-to-third advance on a base hit, and drag bunt staples of the game in the 1890s. He won two batting titles, and his 344 average is the sixth best all-time. In 1894, he also set a record that will most likely never be broken, as he scored 192 runs for the Phillies. With Philadelphia, he teamed up with Sam Thompson and Ed Delahanty uh, to form one of the greatest outfields of all time. And despite his record-setting career, and this is just ridiculous to me, Hamilton didn't earn entry into the Hall of Fame until 1961, which is a full 21 years after he died and 60 years after he played his final game. That just feels like a crime to me. We did not touch on the Hall of Fame and the Hall of Fame voting, and uh, it's, it's criminal what somebody like this was held out for so long. Um, and you can see this is going to happen with a few of the players that were held out just recently. And, you know, some of the reasons are valid and whatever, but, you know, you, when you put up these type of numbers, um, it should be a lock. Yeah, agreed. It's nice that they finally get their due. And like you said, it, it's really a shame that they aren't able to actually be here to enjoy it on Earth. But... Um, it's still nice that there's sometimes there are players who don't just eternally fall through the cracks and there will be players who do that but some of them don't and you know this is a good case of one who didn't thankfully yeah I mean he was Ricky Henderson before Ricky Henderson mm -hmm. he was just a, such an underlooked star and I think you mentioned this on the last show about Babe Ruth and the amount of blacks there is <laughs> <laughs> Bold on this page, and he, Hamilton's got the same thing. Um, and I believe uh, he the, he's one of he um, Delahanty and Thompson also all hit 400 in one season. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just unbelievable. That's all we got for today. Um, and the next show is going to be on December 19th. Uh, we're going to talk about Joe DiMaggio, Al Kaline, Doc Ellis. Doc Ellis is such an interesting character. <laughs> uh, and uh, Memorial Stadium. So, uh, Matt, I hope you enjoyed being on the show. Uh, where can people find you? Yeah, that sounds like a good, good lineup for the 19th, so that would be interesting. Uh, people can find me on Twitter at mmusico8, and if you're looking for a little dosage of home runs while we're waiting for the season to start again, you can head over to www.mlbdailydingers.com. You, um, you can find me at tomsvintagebaseball.com. Uh, we appreciate you joining us for today. today's show, Vintage, uh, Vintage Baseball Rewind. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Uh, visit TomSmintageBaseball.com for more resources as well. 
access to episodes of baseball history. And by all means, please give us some feedback. This is new for Matt and I. We're working together on this show, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, good, bad, or otherwise, just to hear about what you uh, what you like about the show, what you'd like to see, and uh, you know, really help us out. So until next time.